really the crux of where we're looking at. And that specifically uh, looks at the ways in which we segregated, pur purposefully segregated the U.S. in all aspects, specifically not only through the ways in which we acquired land, but also in the ways in which we started zoning at the turn of the 20th century to assure that the Jim Crow laws and laws of segregation not only were enacted on buses in schools, but also in the design of our cities. As long as the United States has been in, uh, in existence, there has been attempts to have national reparations. Unfortunately, uh, those have often, um, those have failed. And uh, you see here on the right-hand side, just a couple of markers, although there are other attempts for reparations in our history, but beginning after the Civil War with uh, the 1865 Sherman Special Order, which people know as 40 Acres and a Mule, um, into pre present day with HR 40, which is very pressing, and there's a lot of efforts right now to have that uh, have a vote uh, on the House floor. Um, so, as you can see, there has been a demand to respond to these historical injustices. Why? Uh, because not only have they continued through unto today, as I demonstrated in the slide with the different errors, but they also have reverberating effects onto today, the long-term impacts with real consequences that demonstrate in every facet of the US significant disparities, black and white disparities. So let's just take a quick look at those. So this is a survey that was done by the Federal Reserve in 2019. And you can see here when looking at wealth gap, homeownership and economic disparity, the white and black disparity is the greatest in the US. Here's a little bit more detailed look at home ownership gaps. Uh, the red uh, line at the bottom of the first graph on the left is uh, black alone, and the black line on top is the white, uh, non-Hispanic white alone. And also similarly, you see on the financial disparities. Education is an area that also demonstrates significant black-white achievement gap. And this has been persistent since we started taking data, uh, statistical data on education uh, after Brown v. Board. And this has not changed significantly, statistically significantly since then. And you see here the National Center for Education Statistics in 2020 and a demonstration of those persistent gaps in all top, in, in all disciplines, academic disciplines. Oftentimes within the field of education, there's a lot of conversation about the uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, we see only, uh, we see a graduation rate uh, that has been slowly increasing, but um, still is statistically significantly different uh, for, black students compared to the white population. And as you see here, the incarceration is 5.9 times more likely for a black individual to be incarcerated than a white, even when comparing the same exact uh, activities. So because of the inability for reparations to be uh, found at the national level, Starting in the 1990s, we began to see local level reparations. And this is actually a reflection of what was happening internationally as well. And this is a table that was put together by the University of Maryland. What that research showed at that time was that despite that there were incidences of successive reparations at the local level, these efforts were done in isolation there was a lack of awareness across the board of who was doing what in different communities, even if they were only 45 minutes apart in distance. And in addition, these were often fueled simply on the backs of uh, volunteers who felt deeply about the need for racial just, justice and repair. And, um, and so oftentimes they came without any type of institutional support or funding. So that's where we decided there was a, a need for creating an African-American redress network. And I'm going to start to talk to you here about who we are and what we do. 
And I want to really uh, specifically focus on the fact that reparations is not just an end goal, it is the process. And with that, we thought very deeply about how we design this project. One of the first things we did was this project became a collaboration between Howard University and Columbia. As a predominantly white institution, we recognized that Columbia should not be forwarding this project. And um, I wish that my partner was here from uh, Howard. I work closely with Billy Wilkerson. Um, she's being a brand new grandma at this moment. Uh, but we do everything together. We collaborate on every single aspect and Howard often leads the way in, uh, in much of the work, particularly because they're, um, the work that they do is housed within the School of Law at the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center. Uh, we do collaborate also with the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia. Um, and so these collaborations are very important in that we're demonstrating that reparations is, a, is an effort that has to be done as we walk through this together. I also want to bring to your attention the purposeful design of the steering committee. On the steering committee, you will see national reparationists, local reparationists. These individuals also help guide the work we do. We are all about intensely listening uh, to the communities that have experienced these historical harms. Uh, as we know, those voices can speak to us from experience and can help lead the way. Our work is framed within the international human rights framework, and it's important for us to pause and just take a look at that because within the US, oftentimes when you say reparations, immediately the response is compensatory. Within the international human rights framework, compensatory is one of the categories, but there are actually five categories within the international human rights framework. And they are satisfaction, which would be something like an apology, an acknowledgement, memorialization, restitution would be a giving back perhaps of land. Compensation is oftentimes what we think about. Those can come in the forms of scholarships, such as uh, what happened with Rosewood, Florida. Rehabilitation can be physical and mental health services. And we've seen those happening in the United States and guarantees of non-repetition. So that might be actually working with policing departments to help them understand their histories and that the uh, racism exists within their institutions, but also that the way they policed exists in the communities that they're policing. So within that framework, the first thing we needed to do is figure out a pathway to engage with community members. So using data analytics and ArcGIS mapping, uh, we began to identify and map local redress efforts, again, identified within the international human rights framework. And although I didn't mention that on the, that the previous slide, what I do wanna say is that there has been increased uh, pressure by the international uh, governance to have the US respond to this. Actually, just in 2021, there was a, a, um, there was a call put out for the US to respond to uh, policing and the ways in which uh, individuals responded to incidences such as the George Floyd killing. Um, but going back to the ArchGIS, we use this in the International Human Rights Framework and it loosely within those categories of historical errors that we demonstrate at the begin, beginning, and we begin to identify local redress efforts. At this point, uh, we are almost done with the United States. We started on the East Coast and have worked our way to the West Coast, and we are currently uh, looking at efforts along the West Coast and the Pacific Ocean, the states that border the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we look at a model of repair in the following way. So what we see within these communities is that first, there needs to be significant, robust, multidisciplinary research on the historical injustices. Communities are having to demonstrate these histories through archival data, genealogical research. Uh, and then once they've uh, provided a robust argument for them, then there is oftentimes the need to demonstrate the measurable impact. So kind of looking at the harms that I discussed at the beginning, but showing them not only at the national level, but also at the local level. And then the efforts towards reparations, redress and repair. 
And those efforts require significant public education, political support, capacity building, and funding. Once we've identified, we then send out a communications blast to those communities. We say, we've identified you. We see that you're working on local reparations. We'd like to engage with you. And we have them fill out a, a form actually to look at these components of repair and then to start to explore ways in which we might provide collaboration. We believe we co-create with them reparation efforts. So after that initial assessment, we start to look at what kinds of resources and research are needed, what methodologies we might need to engage in. And everything we do is transparent and accessible. Oftentimes the communities are leading the way. We simply become a member of their efforts. Student engagement is absolutely essential in everything we do. Students are leading the way with the multidisciplinary research. They're creating communications campaigns. They serve as points of contact for local organizations and are furthering our social media platform and engage directly with the community members. And with that, I'm going to in, uh, introduce our first student uh, who will be speaking about one of the uh, cases in which we've worked in this past um, year, which is Brown Grove, Virginia. I'd like to say before I pass it over to our student that we hope what you take away from this presentation is that, this is, that in order to mitigate systemic racism in the United States, it requires multidisciplinary research and cross-sector expertise and collaboration. Um, so here we will talk about Brown Grove, Virginia and James Lennox. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Mann. My name is James Lennox and I'm a student researcher with AARN. And currently I'm researching the link between black land loss and heirs property laws. And right now I'm gonna be talking to you a bit about our work in Brown Grove, Virginia. Next slide, please. So before we dive into the current work being done in Brown Grove, it's really important to give a brief overview of their history. So Brown Grove now is a predominantly black community but what's important, and it has this really incredible history, is it was settled during the Civil War by freed slaves. 14 families settled, and it was initially 1,000 acres, and it was built on partial swampland. That's particularly important because during that era, swampland was often a refuge for runaway slaves. It was an opportunity to have some protection through the environment, and it was also an opportunity for them to build a community. And that's what Brown Grove was. The 14 members built a really self-sufficient and thriving community. Um, there was uh, predominantly, or all, there was a black church and it's, it was actually named Slash Church. And that's significant because Slash is another word for swamp. That was built by the initial settlers. And what they did there really was incredible. It was a thriving and self-sufficient community. However, with that, unfortunately, comes the threat of existential threats. If you hit the next slide, please. So whenever there are thriving Black communities, what we often see is external harms coming and threatening both their success and their land. And that's been an unfortunate trend throughout Brown Grove's history. Um, what you had was during the 1960s, you had the development of I-95. And that essentially split the community in half. Um, after that, in 1969, there was the building of a municipal airport that further displaced more communities, members taking them off their land. Um, it doesn't stop there. There was a development of a truck stop and a concrete plant. That's again, further encroaching on the community, pushing people off their land that had been within their families for generations. Currently what we're dealing with is Wegmans is building a distribution center on the remaining 200, lake, 200 acres of the initial settlement. And this is disastrous for the community in a number of ways. Whenever we're doing this kind of work, it's really important. And as Dr. Mann highlighted, 
to first address the harms of the community. And there is a really unfortunate trend of harms being committed against this community with the process of land loss that Wegmans is further continuing. The distribution center will cover more than 1.1 million square feet of land. And additionally, it will operate 365 days. The harms that we're looking at are beginning with environmental harms. And this is where we have to address racism as a public health issue, because we already see that the majority of community members in Brown Grove have contaminated water, whether in their well water, their tap water. What we're seeing further environmental destruction is that destruction of the wetlands is going to lead to potential flooding of the roads and on properties of residents. Um, additionally, fumes from trucks can be very, can contain harmful chem chemicals for residents. You have on a historical level, another issue we're dealing with is the erasure of history. And that's where our work comes in and the work of Brown Grove is to preserve that history along with their land. This development will potentially disturb three African-American burial sites, as well as the site of a black only school from the Jim Crow era. There's gonna be 24 hour light and noise coming from the distribution center. Meanwhile, we have residents in Brown Grove living in the immediate vicinity who their daily lives will be disturbed by that noise, by the constant light. There's also because of road traffic where our media kit estimates that there will be an additional 2,864 vehicle trips a day that increases the likelihood of traffic accidents. Um, as well as going back to environmental harms, you have the issue of air pollution from the development in the, um, the center. That could lead to health issues such as cancer, asthma, lung disease, and cardiovascular issues. And that's putting the whole community at risk, including young children, or especially vulnerable. If you could go to the next slide, please. So where we come in is we work with these communities to see what they believe reparative justice should look like, what they want to prioritize. And the community in Brown Grove was particularly adamant about what their desires are. And first and foremost, the priority is to stop the development of Wegmans to, that would encroach on their land, disturb both their environment and their history. Another goal is to preserve the history with the community center, demand clean air and clean water. Those are basic human rights that everyone ha should have, but what we see is across this country with the issue of environmental racism, that black communities are often placed in close proximity to chemical plants, areas that have harmful chemicals, uh, pollutants that are detrimental to their health. And the also what we see is the importance of preserving this really profound history. Like I said, this is really a triumphant story of freed slaves coming together and building a self-sufficient and really thriving community. And it's important to preserve that history, whether that be the burial sites, the black only school, the site of um, slash church, that's all incredibly important. Next slide, please. So where we come in is we've been working with the Brown Grove Preservation Group. And whenever we're working with a group, we want to emphasize the voice and autonomy of the descendants. They're the ones leading the charge and we're advocating for them. We're speaking to what they want. And that's what the Brown Grove Preservation Group is. We wanna be a part of that dialogue. We want to engage with them. And like I said before, then put forward what their desires are, what they believe can remedy the situation. So as Dr. Mann mentioned before, a really important, important part of this work is uh, multidisciplinary studies. We wanna bring in experts from all fields because we are not equipped to do all the heavy lifting. We aren't experts in every field that's gonna affect a community and every harm. What that looks like in Brown Grove, that means bringing in local political leaders, environmental law experts, environmental justice experts, um, 
experts in black burial sites and black history um, and really prioritize that this is for this community a racial issue so we want to bring in experts in those fields of black studies um one thing that came up was we brought in and in um a real estate lawyer and what we determined was that some of the property was purchased by abraham jones in 1909. now this was approximately um, and this was revealed through a title search and some of that land that is Abraham Jones's land is going to be on the site of Brown Grove's distribution center. Where this is significant is the title search by our real estate lawyer determined that this property of Abraham Jones did not have a clear title or deed, meaning that it's heirs property. Now what's heirs property? Heirs property is basically when someone doesn't have a will and they die, their property can't go to one descendant because they're not stating in the will, this is who it's going to go to. So what you have is you have no clear title or deed and you have the property going to all the descendants being shared. Now where that's an issue is you need consensus. You can't have any one member living on the land if they don't all agree. Conversely, you only need one descendant to agree to the prospect of selling the land for it to be sold. Now, this has been especially harmful for Black communities because of several reasons. One of them is, unfortunately, throughout history, we see um, Black communities having a lack of trust in institutions such as lawyers. Why is that? Because lawyers, people in the criminal justice system and legal system have traditionally speaking, been used to oppress Black people. There isn't that trust because they have either haven't had access to them because of something like segregation and the Jim Crow era, or they don't have that trust in them because of the rich history of those people in those positions abusing their power and taking advantage of Black communities. As someone who's reaching, researching heirs' property laws, what we often see, especially historically speaking, is lawyers, instead of coming in to advocate for those families, what they actually will do is come in on behalf of a real estate developer to take advantage of the family and get that one person they need to sign over the land. This is really and a really important discovery for this work because that adds another component to it of that no clear title or deed. And with that, Wegmans is already building on that land, as I mentioned. So in terms of the work we're doing in this campaign, it's also important to tap into publicity. And we've done that through a media kit that gives an outline of the harms being um, carried out against the community, the work that we're doing, as well as the Brown Grove Preservation Group, and an overview of how people can assist in this fight. There's also something that we do a lot of is story mapping, a map that's showing the history of a location over time so people can understand the full scope of the situation. We also have community outreach through network alerts, like we've said before, um, being able to put in a reparation effort and under and be updated as that effort moves along or also being up what we'll do is we will put in alerts for certain key words, such as the name of a state, redress, reparation efforts. So if there is a new redress effort, we become aware of it. Another really important part of our work is what you see there, state coalition support. What that means is bringing together and building consensus by bringing together multiple redress efforts within a state so they can share resources, so they can communicate and assist one another. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Corey. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, my name is Corey. I'm a student at the University of the District of Columbia. Um, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, I, for the last two years, I've kind of had my hand in a number of community activism projects. Uh, but really over the last year, uh, I've really been focused on reparations and kind of getting my hands dirty in the nation's capital. So uh, I'm going to kind of jump in here and just kind of Piggyback where James left off. 
community-centered organizing really is uh, all that we do, right? Um, ARN comes in and says, you know, what is it that gets an effort started? And it, and it very much is the history. Uh, it's, it's, it's based on the community's understanding of their own history, uh, the history that's present. And in, and in this case, right, Brown Grove has actually already done some oral histories and has collected some of those stories from some of the elders and some of the current members of the community to uh, really kind of center that as the heart of the effort. Nothing gets done without history in any effort. Uh, it's where you start, it's where you finish, and it guides everything that we do. Um, and in that sense, right, the network is a partner that is in turn led by the community and its history. Um, our goal really is to ensure that any effort we get we get in touch with, any people that we're working with, uh, have the ability and, and the capacity uh, to take on everything that they need to take on uh, to get done what they want to get done. Um, in Brown Grove's case, right, uh, James mentioned that they want a community center to kind of provide spaces to uh, carry out some of those public education efforts, bringing in members of the community to have uh, some of these harsh discussions about uh, the, the dark history of the community and also some of uh, the triumphs of, of this community, right? Like uh, there's a story about uh, the mother of Brown Grove who uh, is essentially literally, right? Like the, the four or five generations removed uh, ancestral grandmother to everyone you see in this picture excluding myself and a few other folks. <laughs> like that's that's the history of this community and the context, right, that we get from the experts that come in and say, yes, that is that is very much true, but then take into consideration, right, that this community that this woman, you know, essentially founded uh, was a community of escaped enslaved people. Um, that is incredibly powerful to think about in the 1840s there are free peoples living in a community by themselves uh, in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation um, from Billy Wilkerson's father uh, at the retreat that we had recently, which I'll get to a little later, um, about how there was a Civil War battle that had taken place nearby where we were sitting. Um, very, very impactful history. And you don't get right to make recommendations for repair without discussing that. And you certainly don't get to make those recommendations uh, without community input. And so the community really is at the heart. And our goal is to make sure that they've got the longevity and the wheels to get everything that they wanna get done accomplished. And get the next slide. So the weekend of November 6th, uh, we all get together in Brown Grove at a small little lodge um, and you know, the community had asked us to come down and work with them on kind of really getting started, right? They, they've been going for a while um, as a kind of small community-based group, and they've gotten some things done. They've gotten a lot of press coverage. Uh, if you follow the issue, it was in the Washington Post a few times, um, but they're not making as much progress as they'd like to make, and so they, they reach out and they say, hey, we'd love it if you all could put together um, a retreat for us all to come together and, and just kind of start to hash some things out. And so ARN in collaboration with the International Center for Transitional Justice come together and we say, great. Um, everyone received uh, a stipend to come out and participate and really get their hands dirty um, to have some of these harsh discussions. And so day one, you know, Saturday, November 6th, we're all in the room and we begin by discussing right, the, the very distant history, to borrow a term from Boris Bitker, um, the very, very, very distant history of Brown Grove, right, discussing the founding. Um, and everyone brought an artifact with them, and so everybody's kind of passing their artifact around, and we're having these discussions. And, and you know, gradually it, it progresses into a discussion about the more recent history. Uh, and we start to talk about the efforts that they've, you know, embarked on over the last kind of couple of years. And then, you know, at the end of day one, everyone is exhausted, frankly, <laughs> but everyone is excited, right? Because day two is when we get together to really start to have some really foundational discussions about what we're going to do now, right, like going forward. Um, so day two rolls around and everybody gets back together at the lodge 
And this is ARN at work, bread and butter all day long, okay? Um, we get together and we say, okay, you know, let's talk about stakeholders. Um, what does, you know, who, who, what people are you engaging in this effort? And, you know, there are certain groups they've already worked with, um, the, the Virginia Environmental Justice Coalition, um, Razor, and they say, okay, you know, where do they fall in terms of uh, support? Where do they fall in terms of political power? Um, how reliable are they in, you know, can you count on them to come and support you in an effort when you go to do something? Um, and really start to have some of those discussions about strategy to figure out what it is that they wanna get done. And the image that you're seeing on the right-hand side is actually my scribbling. So pardon the chicken scratch, but there's a lot of really important information there. Uh, you can see it in big letters on the left-hand side, stop Wegmans, right? That's, that's the big piece that, you know, for a while, that's been the goal. Um, and in some ways, right, that is very much a preventative measure. Um, the Brown Grove is, has three burial sites on the land that Wegmans is trying to build on. Um, and that's one wrong and illegal, if, and, and there are a number of issues with it. Um, but even in that, right, like Wegmans has put on a very, very solid face of kind of, uh, yes, we'd love to, to work with you all to figure out what's going on here. But then they hire an archaeologist that really doesn't know what they're doing as it relates to African-American burial sites, uh, let alone right, the considerations of how the bodies were buried. Um, we were talking about how the bodies are buried at the retreat, and they're like, yeah, they're wrapped in cloth. And I'm like, yeah, the, the equipment they're using would not pick up a, a cloth burial. Um, and so there's all these things kind of coming out of the retreat. And one of the things that really sticks with me is this kind of notion of principle-based leadership. This is something that we employ here at AARN. And Dr. Mann really, and, and Billy did a really good job of kind of bringing that out at the retreat. Um, and essentially, right, there's, there was, all, I think up until that point, there was one person that was really kind of serving as uh, the point, right? Like every organization they were working with was communicating with this one person. And this one person was like really, really invested, but she's also uh, one person, right? And uh, principle-based leadership essentially says, you know, instead of consolidating all of the decision-making power in one person, let's be led by principles and in turn empower the collective uh, to take some action. And so, frankly, you know, we asked the question, you know, what is it that, you know, why are you here essentially? You know, what is it that's driving you uh, to do this work? And the answers, right, are, are there plain in view. And I think the biggest one there is honoring the ancestors. Um, that's the biggest piece, I think, for, for every member of the community. Um, they're really, really invested in making sure that the ancestral history uh, is preserved, protected, and amplified in the ways that it needs to be. Um, and so, you know, day two, we've, we've, we've sat down and we've done all this stuff. And, and now, right, part two of day two, we, we sit down with everyone and we actually bring in some of those community stakeholders. Uh, the Virginia Environmental Justice Coalition was there, uh, represented by Queen Shabazz. Um, the Chesapeake, I can't remember the name of this group, but there's a number of groups that come together uh, to essentially pitch themselves to the Brown Grove Preservation Group and say, this is what we have to offer. This is what we can do for you. And at the end of day two, uh, Brown Grove is now discussing organizing formally as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, they're formally having these discussions about how do we uh, more efficiently reach out to people that we need to contact with. Um, and now there's a strategy, right? There, one of the things that really was discussed is this issue of the board of supervisors. Now, I'm a political science major. Uh, I love politics, and so I follow local elections. If you follow local elections, you know good and well, uh, Virginia is red, very, very red at the moment. Um, Governor Northam is on his way out. Uh, Glenn Youngkin is on his way in. Uh, not to say that they had support from Governor Northam to start, but uh, it certainly doesn't look good uh, for the future. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, right, is it, uh, this is Hanover County. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, this is a very red county, and in turn, they are not all that supportive of the work that's being done here. And so that, you know, these discussions about, okay, how do you begin to engage with the Board of Supervisors? And what people start to realize very quickly, right, is Yes, the comprehensive plan is coming out. So we have to have somebody attend. 
the planning commission meetings to make sure that our voices are being heard. Um, and then we need to start doing some outreach to, frankly, people that don't look like us, right? This is a predominantly African-American community that is surrounded by rural white family homes. Um, and so that discussion about, okay, maybe we need to find ways to reach out to those people, right? Because the ways in which you can get a, a politician to do something is when you have his constituency start, start complaining, right? And so once we start to reach out to the constituency and have them uh, realize that the efforts that we're working on, right, are coinciding with the efforts they're working on, right? There's already collaboration, I think, between Protect Hanover and the Brown Grove Preservation Group, uh, two very distinctly different organizations uh, that are doing work kind of towards the same end, uh, that's how you start to kind of sway the political uh, pendulum towards uh, uh, Brown Grove Preservation Group and really start to kind of get things done. Uh, so I get the next slide. I'm gonna kind of focus on one bullet point because we talked about a bunch of this earlier. Um, the big one for me is this moratorium on industrial development. Um, environmental justice is something that frankly is just at the heart of the Brown Grove Preservation Group's uh, mission, right? Um, James mentioned the airport. There's also the cement plant. Uh, Amazon just built a warehouse not too far. There's I-95 that runs right there, right? This community is very much dealing with a lot of environmental burdens and they really don't need a Wegmans distribution center. I was talking with some of the members of the community um, and I said, well, is it an issue of jobs, right? Like why did they choose Brown Grove, if there's so much stuff that's already here, I can't imagine that there's a, a shortage of jobs. She's like, no, there, there's, there's no shortage of jobs. Uh, I really don't understand why we need this, <laughs> right? And, and that's one of the, one of the you know, considerations that we're, we're taking in is, you know, there's this kind of fine line we're trying to walk between uh, economic policy and environmental policy and kind of understanding that sure, this brings jobs, but it's also polluting in the, the environment. And so one of the things that comes out of day two is this moratorium. And it's essentially saying, if you want to build in our community, you need to ask us. Without our consent, you're not building anything, right? And in that way, they're moving towards uh, this kind of clean air and clean water. Uh, as a matter of structure, that is kind of structured as a people's tribunal. Um, another kind of context, it's been, it's been structured, I think in Britain is like a, a, a block voting system, where essentially there's a community along a block and when someone wants to build something in the neighborhood, the block has to approve it. And if the block doesn't, it doesn't go forward. Um, and so trying to reshape the ways that the, the political uh, levers are kind of being pulled to restore some power to this community, uh, that's one of the big things for us, um, especially because, again, the environmental impacts that this community has been dealing with for the last 150 years are just drastic. Uh, and we really wanna make sure that what's left is is preserved and then what was taken is restored so with that i'm going to hand it over i think to uh, irene and claire hello my name is irene and i'm currently a student at barnard college so i'm very excited to be here um claire who will be speaking later about evanston claire and i were both really involved with the case of evanston and um, I'd like to kind of introduce what our work was centered around as well as the historiography of Evanston. Um, next slide, please. So Evanston really serves as a great example of what Dr. Mann served as needing multidisciplinary research as well as cross-sector collaboration. And we see this especially in Evanston because we have some key partnerships with um, who was the past Alderman Rue Simmons, um, and COBRA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and Shorefront Legacy. And what's really important in the work that we did in Evanston is that although AARN was brought on to provide a letter of support and create an impact study that demonstrates how the history of housing discrimination um, affects contemporary problems, we also see how that could not have been relevant nor um, impactful without the work that these three other figures have done. And so we see a cross-sector collaboration with Alderman Ruth Simmons, um, who was a past alderman, but she really put and um, put the political support and the political agenda in line in order for reparations to be um, to come into fruition in Evanston. 
And secondly, we see NCOBRA who had the grand the groundswell of the support from the people to really make that kind of change possible as well as Shorefront Legacy. And they have been extremely important um, since they have done a 10 year study that focused on the historiography of Evanston. So like Corey said, really emphasizing the oral history and the, the first person um, effects and testimonies that these people have endured in Evanston um, in order for us to really understand and educate ourselves about how long this issue has been around, um, issue of housing discrimination. So next slide, please. We'll be looking specifically at the history of Evanston's housing discrimination. Um, a lot of the problems we see in contemporary times has been a problem for generations and has been institutionally, um, intentionally designed for these communities. And in 1910, we start with the Great Migration, where we see that Evanston was had a physical barrier, barrier of a railroad line that separated the Black residents from the white residents um, in the Evanston area. And like Corey and James have mentioned previously in Brown Grove, we see that the I-95 or the physical barrier is the same thing as Evanston, where we see the railroad line, and that some of these trends really are mechanisms of separating communities and enforcing discriminatory housing policies. And in 1920s, um, we see that a lot of these homes of Black uh, people have been relocated and Black families have been forced out of specific regions. Um, if you look at the map at the bottom right hand corner, we see that one, three, and four families that were, um, Black families that were there were moved into the second area in red. And I'll get to this in a bit, but that reflects Evanston's fifth ward. Um, but in the 1940s, homeowners loan corporations de facto red lines for real estate agents, um, and they designed color-coded maps designated, designating the credit worthiness of certain neighborhoods. And so we see that communities were redlined and were labeled as hazardous, um, and they essentially were denied federal housing administration backed mortgages. So we see with this uh, predatory loans and lending and inability for people to get access to homes um, if they were applicants who were Black. And more on Evanston's fifth ward, we see in part that part two of the map in that triangle shape is that it was a 95% Black population. So a lot of the majority of the Black people within the Evanston region were concentrated into that one physical area. And we also see a crowding of homes, which reaches 150% occupation. And Claire will get more into the harms that we see that come out of the situation, but we also see that they were not able to expand into the land outside of the fifth ward because of the railroad tracks that were intentionally placed um, in order for, to keep the Black people and the Black residents in that specific area. And so we naturally see a creation of a ghetto um, with the sole purpose of commercial use. And when we think about the correlations between Brown Grove and what they're facing, as well as the history of Evanston, the similarities are not surprising as these are intentional and um, designed efforts to enforce housing discrimination, as well as just segregation in general throughout America. Um, and with this, when we see the map of Evanston as a whole, we see segregated suburbs and a concentration of Black families in one specific location. Um, next slide, please. And so this is a map that looks at the racial and ethnic distribution um, in Evanston. And it's not surprising that even without the lines that specifically show what the wards look like, part two and part five represent the fifth ward um, since there is a majority black population there in contrast to the other areas that are majority white populations. And we see the stark physical barrier that goes through six and five and two are, it's the railroad line that creates that physical barrier um, that prohibits the expansion of these families into other residential areas. And Claire will now kind of go more in depth into the harms that came out of this. 
Hi, um, great job, Irene. My name is Claire. I am a third year student at Columbia College, double majoring in political science and human rights. And I joined the Redress Network over the summer and I've continued working um, and been really grateful to be a part of this community um, through the fall. Um, so I'll start talking a little bit about how ARN got involved in Evanston. Um, the first thing we did was write a letter of support. Um, so prior to the city council's hearing in March, a law firm, Boyd and Gray and Associates, actually issued a public letter to the mayor of Evanston challenging the constitutionality of the restorative housing program. Um, they claimed that the program unconstitutionally discriminated on the basis of race because the restorative housing program established that applicants must be of African-American descent. Um, they also claim that the program failed to provide narrowly tailored means of furthering a compelling state interest. And so what we ended up doing was issuing a response to that on behalf of ARN, the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard um, University, um, and Columbia defending the need for race-based reparations. Um, and that anticipated legal challenge from Boyd and Gray and Associates is really what spurred us to conduct the impact study and to establish evidence for the injury to the Black community in Evanston and defend the need for race-based reparations. Um, I'll go into that more um, on my next slide, but at the request of Alder Robin Simmons, we ended up beginning our research and we put together a report over the course of several weeks. Um, the impact study had several goals. First, to provide a history of the effects of past de jure segregation by the city, um, which Irene just went over to provide context for the current de facto segregation that persists in Evanston, looking again to that slide that we just looked at, um, where we see again, black and white communities starkly um, segregated um, within the different wards of the city. Third, um, to demonstrate the scope of the injury and harm to the black community in Evanston. And fourth, to establish that down payment assistance programs are a narrowly tailored form of redress. Um, and the reason that we did that was to demonstrate that there was a compelling state interest furthered by the program that was remedying the harms to the Black community stemming from the discriminatory policies Irene outlined. And secondarily, that the restorative housing program was a narrowly tailored remedy to those harms by directly targeting housing disparities, which were the cause of those injuries. And lastly, what we're working on right now as our next step is conducting an economic calculation of the positive benefits that the restorative housing program can have intergenerationally. Um, next slide, please. So looking through um, the same framework of historical injustice, harms, and reparations as repair that we used for Brown Grove, um, I'm now turning to the harms that the Black community in Evanston um, endured as a result of the discriminatory policies implemented in the early and mid 20th century. Um, what we did in our impact study was really zero in on Evanston to demonstrate the specific scope of the injury. Um, but again, this is mirroring the racial disparities that we see playing out across the country um, that Dr. Mann outlined in the beginning of the presentation. So we broke down the harms that we witnessed into several categories, economic disparities, health and healthcare disparities, over-policing of black communities and educational disparities. Um, starting with the first one, um, Looking specifically to Evanston, there is a tremendous wage gap between black and white individuals um, standing at $46,000. The unemployment rate is double that of white residents and the percentage of African-Americans living below the poverty line in Evanston is significantly greater than that of white Americans. Um, and again, Evanston is sort of this microcosm of what we're seeing across the country, right? Black employees nationally are play, paid 82% of what white employees are. The median household wealth for African Americans is on average one ninth of that of white Americans and home ownership rates are almost 30% lower for black than white Americans. Um, so again, looking at home ownership as this metric of um, wealth disparity and a cause of wealth disparity um, nationally and in Evanston. Um, a second impact that we saw were disparities between um, in healthcare and between black and white Americans. So again, nationally, African-Americans have higher mortality rates than whites. There is a 3.8 year life expectancy gap between black and white individuals. And urban hospitals are more likely to close if there's a higher proportion of black residents in the population. And one of the most prominent ways that we've seen racial disparities in healthcare highlighted um, are through the ways that they've been exacerbated, of course, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in Evanston specifically, the cumulative positive test rates for African-Americans are twice that of white residents. Um, so tremendous disparities once again. Um, 
when we look to over policing, um, black residents are policed at higher and disproportionate rates. So Evanston's population is 18.1% African American and 65.6% white. And again, like Irene showed on the map, that is um, there's much higher populations of black Americans in certain areas of the city. Again, Ward 5 is 95% black. Um, but looking to the, um, the policing rates, 60% of adult arrests in 2017 were of African American individuals, and only 29% were of white individuals. So not only are we seeing that more than double of uh, those who are arrested are African American, but that's a disproportionate rate, looking again to the fact that African Americans only comprise 18% of the population. And I'll show some more graphics on this later, but these tre uh, trends are particularly prevalent with marijuana policing and the ways that police treat black individuals. Um, lastly, we looked at educational disparities, which again will have an intergenerational impact um, on the community in Evanston. Uh, so we looked directly at School District 65, which encompasses Evanston and neighboring Skokie. Um, and between grades three through eight there, white students um, perform at 3.9 grade levels above um, the national average. So they're excelling beyond um, the average American student, while African-American students are trailing behind at half a grade level. So tremendous disparities between um, the academic performance in black and white students. Um, and disciplinary policies as well are implemented um, uh, in a racially discriminatory way with African-American students more than 3.3 times more likely to be suspended by their white peers. So if you look again to this graphic that I put on the side, um, this is just another illustration looking at the wealth gap of how what we see in Evanston is a sort of microcosm of national trends. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to show some maps here, just digging into the economic disparities. Um, I have three maps. So the first map on the left illustrates the median household income in different neighborhoods of Evanston. And the darker areas are areas of more concentrated wealth with the lighter areas um, being areas with lower median household incomes. And you know, again, if you think of that, of that map that Irene showed, we're immediately seeing that the area in the center where Ward 5 is, where again, 95% um, of the population is black, um, it's a much, much lighter, much, much lower median household income area. Um, the next map to sort of highlight that even more is the um, breakup of the population that is black. Um, and we see again, this is sort of the polar opposite or the flip side of the map that we see um, on the left um, where the areas again in the fifth ward in the center that have higher populations of black residents are the areas that mirror um, areas of lower concentrated wealth. Um, and the map on the right, um, which demonstrates the distribution of the white population, um, much more closely mirrors the map that we see on the left, on um, the far left of the median household income. Um, again, wards six and seven at the top left and right have much higher populations of white individuals and much more concentrated areas of wealth. Um, next slide, please. And the second category of harm I'm just going to dive into a little bit more is over-policing. Um, so I have three charts here. The first um, is a chart of the total police arrests in Evanston. Um, the blue portion of the chart is the um, pop, uh, proportion of um, total police arrests that are of black individuals. So that's 63%, an overwhelming majority compared to the other um, racial categories. Looking specifically to marijuana arrests, that's even more. So the red portion of the chart, 71% of marijuana arrests are of black individuals. And lastly, when we look at the ways that the police are engaging with black in individuals in chart three, we see that 70%, that light blue area, of police pat downs are of black individuals. And bear in mind once again, that this is not only an overwhelming majority, but a disproportionate majority. So 18% of the population is African-American, 65% is white, but 70% of pat downs, 71% of marijuana arrests, and 63% of arrests are of black individuals. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Great. Um, so in November of 2019, history was made. Um, the City of e Council of Evanston passed and the mayor signed Resolution 126R19, which established the local reparations fund. Um, and so what this ended up doing would um, was committing the first $10 million raised from Evanston's municipal cannabis retailers occupation tax, um, which is a 3% tax on cannabis sales. 
um, to a fund specifically for racial reparations. Um, and this was tremendously historic because Evanston is the first city in the country to implement a program of this kind. Um, so again, a, a tremendously historic piece of legislation. And in March, 2021 of this year, um, they passed a resolution implementing the first phase of this process. Um, so they created what they called the restorative housing program, which would direct um, $400,000 from the local reparations fund to um, a series of $25,000 individual housing grants, which would go to those directly impacted or descendants of those directly impacted by the discriminatory housing policies implemented between 1919 and 1969. Um, and these funds could end up be being used for three purposes, um, home ownership through down payment assistance, home improvements, or mortgage assistance. Um, and again, the fact that this program is funded by cannabis tax revenue um, was a direct response to the ways that the um, marijuana policing has been used to over-police um, and oppress Black communities. Um, next slide. And now Irene is going to talk a little bit about the economic impacts, which is what we're working on right now. So to uh, go off where Claire ended, at looking at the economic impacts, how we're going to quantify how housing discrimination affects general wealth equity. And the primary goal um, of this was to understand how Evanston's reparation affects African-Americans wealth and racial wealth gap, especially as we've seen with all of the harms um, we see that this is a generational problem and it has caused generations of people to not have the wealth accrual as seen in white families. And so the model, as Claire mentioned, was to pretend that Evanston gave 25% um, adjusted with inflation to African-American residents to purchase homes in the early 2000s. And this is attempting to understand how housing reparations in Evanston will help close the racial housing wealth gap 20 years down the road. Um, and there are various models that economists, um, Romeo Arahan and Julie Hewitt, who are collaborating with us on this impact, um, economic impact study are using to get an estimate for that number. And this is really important because we're, this would ultimately help us identify how much more wealth these families of recipients have in 2020 and how that, well, in 2020, but like how that would affect the racial wealth gap and especially like how the long-term effects of family wealth on the next generation will be affected. And this will give us a success story as to how future generations will be able to receive um, uh, reparations and how this can be implemented at a far larger scale or in local reparation efforts and how those um, reparations will help family wealth um, and just families, future families um, obtain that kind of opportunity that many of their past ancestors didn't have. And so this next phase will estimate the effect of the increase in wealth on education, income, and the next generation. And this is really exciting because it will give um, our research as well as many other local reparation efforts a quantifiable number um, to point to when the time comes for, well, will this work? And how much of an effect will this effort have in the long run? Um, and next slide, please. So lastly, why does ARN's work matter? Um, our technical assistance program centers around the needs and the work that community members are doing. So as Corey mentioned, um, that role of community organizers, local politicians like Robin Rue Simmons, um, descendant communities is a tremendously essential component of the local movement for reparations. Um, so when Alder woman Robin Rue Simmons reached out to us requesting support on the impact study and on the letter, um, we responded. And this is just a quote below um, about the role that higher education research institutions like Howard and Columbia play in supporting local reparations efforts. Um, specifically through capacity building. Um, and as Dr. Mann kind of talked about, our goal is really to bridge the gap between grassroots organizers and city level politicians um, and other local change makers spearheading reparations work um, and universities whose contributions have traditionally and historically been contained more to the realm of academia. Um, and what we really hope is that ARN can kind of serve as a model um, for other institutions around the country to play a similar role in the local movement for reparations. Um, next slide. So 
I'm going to jump in and kind of kick off our little reflection section. Um, I really do uh, enjoy the work that I do, <laughs> um, in particular because um, that grassroots level organizing is so essential. Um, you really don't get anything done without it. Uh, there is no ARN without communities, and uh, a lot of communities, frankly, go without a lot uh, because organizations like this don't exist. Um, and we're a small collective, right? Like there's maybe like 15 of us, but like we put in, you know, a couple hours here and there and, and we really try and push forward uh, everything that we touch kind of to the next level. Um, but it really does all start with the community. Uh, I really can't stress that enough. Um, communities and their history uh, are at the center of every effort. And when they say, you know, this is something we really think we need to, to emphasize. Right. Uh, if, if Brown Grove says, you know, the, the focus, right, like right now, the focus for them is these three burial sites. Uh, that's the focus. And then we, we focus our efforts and we do what they ask us to do. Um, we assist in any way that we can. Uh, and in that way, right, I think, and I speak for all of us, I think in this way, uh, it's a privilege and a blessing to kind of occupy these spaces and, uh, you know, be able in some way, right, to try and affect change. Um, and I can kind of pick up from there. And one of the most frustrating parts about the academic portion of the reparations efforts as AARN is providing is noticing how much gap there is between the research and especially when we're trying to get the firsthand accounts of um, the people who are most affected by the discriminatory practices, we see that the research really isn't there. There is no um, historical logging or preservation of that kind of work. And that's why the work done by Shorefront Legacy as seen in Evanston and various other local reparation efforts is so important because it really encaptures and preserves um, the oral history as well as the essential proof of how harmful these discriminatory policies were um, for the future generations. And um, now we are using those um, resources as ways for us to really create that argument that reparations is so, so needed in these communities. Um, and just as a student, when we are looking for um, the evidence or the historical impacts, it's, it's frustrating to see how little there is that supports reparation works or it really focuses on how it affects, um, how discriminatory practices affects families across the board um, and in multidisciplinary ways. And I think it really touches to the core of our model for reparations and harms is that we need the cross-sector collaboration and the multidisciplinary approach because Without that, it really is a fruitless effort, um, especially given that academia and higher ed does not really support this in ways and at the scale that it should be. And I'll just jump in following. Um, I am also a political science major. And you know, I think kind of going off of what Corey had said, something that I learned from the work that we um, you know, did in Evanston is that I think so often um, when people talk about reparations, they think of things like HR 40, right? The federal um, kind of efforts at legislation that have remained stagnant for 30 years. And we keep asking sort of why can't we do that? Why can't we even create a commission just to start talking about reparations? And I think what I realized is that a better question to ask is who is already making change at the local level? People like Alderwoman Robin Rue Simmons, people like Renata Harris um, in Brown Grove are already doing this work across the country. It's happening in Virginia and in Evanston and in Detroit and across cities across the country. And I think that that's something that doesn't get enough media attention and doesn't get enough recognition. Um, and I think realizing again, our role as a research institution and as students that we can contribute to that is something that's so, so exciting to me. Um, but realizing that we have a role to play in supporting these local actors who are already um, building the movement for local reparations um, instead of, you know, wondering why our Congress people haven't done anything at the federal level yet. Um, so that's something that I think I definitely learned from my work in Evanston, um, but also just realizing the need for kind of tangible empirical evidence um, of those harms and that that's something that's very difficult to demonstrate. And that again, um, 
university support um, has a very important and um, impactful role to play in. I'll just, and I just want to start off by echoing what my fellow um, students have said and that I'm extremely grateful for the work we do at AAR and having the opportunity to engage. I think, and I have faith in our work, I think what for me is the most exciting part is engaging with descendants, engaging with people who have been wronged. Um, and the way I've done this through this recent project I'm doing on Ayers property is largely through oral histories. There's the academic component where I'm researching kind of the extent of heirs properties and mechanisms behind the law, but I've been conducting oral history interviews with people um, who have been, had experience with heirs property, whether it's, you know, black residents of areas losing their land. Um, and one thing that I've noticed throughout it, um, and that's very deeply upsetting to me, is there's a lack of awareness about specifically what heirs property are. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing some people who are experts in their field, and they all start off by saying, yeah, before my individual experience with heirs property, I really knew nothing about it. And I think what's alarming to me about that is in order to address any specific harm, we first have to comprehend them. And when we're dealing with such deeply instituted racism, um, I think it's intentional that we oftentimes don't know the full extent of the laws. Um, and it, it can feel like one step forward and two steps backwards when you know, you're becoming aware of something, but then you find that it has these complex mechanisms with heirs property, like I mentioned, where it only takes that one descendant to say, hey, I wanna sell that land. Um, and what I really feel like is with these, within those complex um, methods, it's made easy for vulnerable people to be taken advantage of. And I think that that's where our work comes in. We've talked about the multidisciplinary aspect of our work, working with experts, working with people who have more expertise from uh, than us and learning. And that's been a really incredible experience. Um, and I think that in order for this to work, like we've mentioned, it, it really is prioritizing that um, descendant voice. Um, on a personal note, my um, professor from UDC, Dr. Amanda Huron, I believe she's here today. And I wanna personally thank her because she really inspired my interest in oral history and kind of grew me to become proficient in the interviewing method. And for anyone who's not familiar with oral history, I really do encourage you to do some research, read it. It's applicable in so many different fields, but in this work, I think it's incredibly important um, in the in terms of gathering firsthand, you know, information from people who have these experiences, and I think that gives us the ability to then base what we do off of their experiences, what they prioritize. Uh, Corey, Irene, Claire, James, what an incredible job you did today. Um, you truly are amazing. And as uh, everyone can see, this project would not work without these incredible students who spend an, an exceptional amount of time um, researching and engaging with the community. And so um, I really want to use this opportunity to give a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you and to also uh, your peers that are not here today are other student uh, researchers that work alongside us at the African American Redress Network, both at Howard and at Columbia. And we should note that Corey and James are from the University of District Columbia, another HBCU um, in which we are incredibly grateful. Um, we do have students from other universities as well. One of our students is from the University of Washington. Washington, Seattle. Um, and so we, um, we welcome individuals to join us because um, in my reflection, um, this work is, is, is uh, never done. Um, there's so much to do and we are constantly being asked to uh, provide technical assistance and research and resources um, to elevate the efforts that are happening on the ground floor. 
and to co-collaborate with those communities in an effort to advance this work. So uh, the call is great. The call is urgent. And, um, and the call is now. And it's, it's, you know, and it's been there for the entire length of our history. So uh, we welcome anybody to, to join forces with us um, and to do this most meaningful work. And honestly, as one of the students said, it is truly an honor and privilege to work with the communities. And we are humbled uh, by their um, efforts and, 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 and being able to work alongside them every, every day. So with that, I guess um, we'll see if there are questions um, in the Q and A. Um, let's see. Have you discovered State of Virginia collaboration in the Brown Grove land theft? Does somebody want to answer that? Is this like I, I didn't see that one in the Q and A? But is this essentially asking, like, do we know of the land that's been taken? Yeah, it looks as if. Um, so we have two different. We have the Q and A and the and the chat. It says, "Have you discovered State of Virginia collaboration in the Brown Grove land theft?" Not to my knowledge. Um, I will say that it's likely, right? Whether it's at, uh, and this is something that we see not necessarily in land theft, but in the ways in which there's zoning land. Um, I think it was uh, Charlene's property that I think she wanted to build something or uh, she was trying to petition uh, the clearing of land behind her home. And she didn't realize it right at the time, but when she went to you know make the complaint, uh, she finds out that her land was rezoned from residential to industrial. Um, and so there's definitely some state action occurring. Um, and oftentimes, right, like there's definitely instances of like the use of the domain in other cases. But I think in particular here in Brown Grove, it looks like it's zoning practices uh, currently that are being used to kind of take land. I'm just gonna piggyback on that for a minute. Thank you, Corey. Um, one thing that's important to note is that in reality, um, Rebecca, uh, the governor actually was supportive of the development of Wegmans. Um, and there were tax incentives given to Wegmans for development on this track of land. So um, that is not in there, that has not been beneficial, obviously. Um, although we have found some political, uh, ind some individuals within the governance locally that have been supportive of Brown Grove. Um, okay, do you know, um, you mentioned that there are 450 local redress efforts. Do you know if they are aware of each other's efforts? Is there a community knowledge sharing network that those who are getting started might tap into? That's a great question. Mary, and I'm going to take that one because it's something we're working on. So the network works um, collaboratively and people do, we do have mailing lists and people are on those and we do make connections for them. Um, and we hold conferences and convenings every year so that they can uh, connect with each other on them. There is a shared um, contact list um as well and so organizations can connect through those contact lists but we're constantly having individuals reach out to us as well asking for pointed contacts um an example recently we started engaging with kansas city reparations coalition and they wanted to speak to another city that was looking at reparations and so we put them in contact with king boston out of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, to engage and learn about their processes there and to see what was applicable to the Kansas City Reparation Coalition. Um, I see that there's another question. Considering the parallels, although in 
commensurable of land theft between Black and Indigenous communities. Are there any current or burgeoning partnerships with Indigenous community leaders in the area? Um, that's a great question. We thought we've thought about that, and at some point we will expand. Um, but we um, felt strongly from the beginning that we wanted to look specifically at the African American um, historical injustices and pointedly at reparations for African Americans and um, people of African descent. Uh, in what ways have your original views and understanding of the Black experience in the United States changed? Okay, this is for the students. In other words, what prior knowledge and care did you bring to this project? And how has your awareness and the impact of your newfound knowledge affected you personally? I can start on this one. Um, I think for me, what changed it wasn't too much, but the main thing was just the level of oppression. I think going into this work, it's impossible to ignore that we're, you know, a country based on racist ideas um, that at time has, I, I often say the government type, I think has bordered on just plain white supremacy. Um, so I think going in, it's impossible to ignore the, the levels of institutional racism in this country. And, you know, we all knew that coming in. For me, it was kind of what I talked about in the reflection, understanding the mechanisms that allow for oppression, legal loopholes with heirs property, um, and how, you know, racism isn't always in your face. It's not always, you know, segregation. It can be these legal practices, these loopholes, these political mechanisms to oppress people and to um, rob Black people of the opportunity to develop generational wealth. Um, and I think also what I've learned is just throughout this, that there is kind of a guideline, um, a skeleton for how to engage with groups of descendants, how to prioritize them. And it's not gonna be the same for every redress effort, but um, I remember in an early conversation I had with Dr. Mann when I started, um, she really emphasized the most important part of this work is um, allowing for descendant autonomy and for their voices to be placed at the forefront. And like I said, all efforts look different, but I think that really is the most important component to a successful redress effort. I think this is a great question for us to end on. And if everybody could give like a, you know, a one or two minute response, I think it would be great. I can go next. Um, one thing that I found very shocking, this is actually with the Brown Grove um, case. I was part of a Brown Grove meeting and there was a professor on, I believe like African-American burial grounds um, in one of the other universities, but this emphasis on how when the city came in to essentially like quantify the worth of the history and the amount of um, importance that the land in Brown Grove held, they really disregarded all of the African-American history and the importance of um, the church and the burial grounds and the artifacts that there that was there. And I think one of the biggest things that I found shocking was the erasure of history that we're constantly seeing. And this very, as I think it's especially harmful once we start trying to like quantify these things, but like the obvious um, disregard for that importance of the church, the slash church that's there in Brown Grove, as well as um, just the the preservation of the burial ground is so, so important. And I think that seeing that firsthand, how the government constantly fails to preserve and remember the important history that lies on this land in Brown Grove, as well as various other places in the country, I think is very shocking for me. And I think it was a critical reminder of how we should always question the history that we're told as well as how we should you know constantly seek to find more truth and more history behind the ones that we're essentially given right off the bat so um yeah just as a student i think that's really important for me moving forward um in what i want for 
my education and my future career to really think about what that might look like in terms of, you know, really challenging the status quo. I guess to jump in as well. Um, so when I originally joined the project, um, I think what made me first really passionate about racial justice was a lot of work that I'd done with um, low income students in schools in DC. I'm also from Washington, DC, um, where there is tremendous, um, you know, exist persisting segregation and racial disparities just in terms of the demographic makeup of the city. Um, and that's something I saw a lot in the schools. Um, I've worked with incarcerated individuals and obviously racial disparity is a tremendous, tremendous um, issue there as well. And I think what I realized was that um, all of these issues that I cared about um, are again, stemming from really this one root cause of just the systemic pervasive racism that's been implemented throughout the country through policies like those we saw in Evanston. And I think working on the impact study, specifically looking at how one policy like the zoning practices that we saw, you know, between 1919 and 1969 can have these, this sort of like umbrella of other impacts throughout all these different facets of life um, in over policing and education in healthcare and housing in wealth, and that the impacts of those will persist for generations. And it seems like a tremendously overwhelming problem to tackle. But when you look at the root causes and start attacking the root causes and seeing how we can remedy that through, again, a more targeted and kind of narrowly tailored um, approach, that is the first step. Um, and again, this is a tremendous process that we're working on, um, but it's one that I think um, I'm beginning to feel a bit more hopeful about um, in that a lot of different um, elements of life that we see racial disparities in can be um, tackled through addressing racial reparations. So um, for the last four-ish years, I've been working on my thesis as a part of UDC's kind of consortium uh, senior SIM uh, setup. Um, and that was kind of being done abstractly over the last kind of couple of years. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with grassroots organizations. I did some tenant organizing in DC and Southeast uh, with low income tenants. Um, after that, I joined on a project with Dr. Amanda Huron, uh, who again, like thank you, put me in the right places at the right time. Um, and that was really my first experience with like hands-on reparations work. Um, and I'm still working with that project. I'm the chair of the policy implementation working group. Um, and then uh, in the last year, right, the pandemic has hit, I quit my job and got a new one, <laughs> helping low-income tenants uh, receive rental assistance and other programs. Um, and I think what hit me was I was working my new job and I work for the Urban League, right? This is a civil rights organization. And I have to ask, right, like why is a civil rights organization uh, facilitating and, and you know, disseminating rental assistance funds uh, primarily to African American communities east of the river in Washington, DC. And the answer becomes quickly very, very uh, apparent, right? Um, there's a river, there's a highway, uh, those are the barriers. Um, for about 150 years, uh, the city actively kind of worked to push its African American population, uh, which frankly was relatively affluent and free in the 1840s. Uh, and push them from the more affluent neighborhoods down into Southeast, which at that point had been run down um, by the previous residents. And then the residents that were there either moved out to PG County or they moved to Northwest um, into what was essentially becoming single family uh, lots and purchasing homes, raising their children and kind of living the domestic bliss that is America. Um, and so in a lot of ways, when I got onto this project in September, um, I was super stressed and I was concerned that I wasn't gonna have enough time um, and I'm finding I have a little more time than I, uh, I anticipated. And so, uh, as it relates to like these projects, I mean, it's, you come in and, and you start to realize how wide ranging the issues we're dealing with are. Um, and I'll use that as kind of a segue, uh, back into Dr. Mann. Um, if like you're doing work, whatever it is, right? Like if you're doing environmental justice work, if you're doing uh econ work if you're an accountant uh by training whatever it is right like those are skills that people need 
um, if ever you're sitting around and you're like, I love the stuff that I do, just not the work that I'm doing, <laughs> please join us. Um, we could always use the manpower. Corey, you, you took the words <laughs> from right out of my mouth. Um, absolutely. If anybody's interested, I put the uh, website in the chat. Um, I also put our direct email to our organization. Um, and I will just say in closing for myself that um, I began working in this area about 15 years ago deeply. Um, and um, there's to talk about how it's changed me personally would be um, would would be a book, <laughs> um, because this work um, is so as I said so so absolutely urgent and um, and we have to do some deep listening to communities uh, in order to forward this work. And the systemic racism that exists, as we mentioned in this program, is um, incredibly uh, woven in every, every single aspect of our society, as James was uh, referring to. And in order for us to actually forward reparation efforts, it does take that cross-sector um, collaboration and it does take rigorous multidisciplinary research because that is an outcome of 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 the harms it's in every facet and so in order to attack this we have to intentionally engage every discipline and every bit of our resources and research to actually push things forward <clears throat> so i hope you will join us um, we welcome everyone and uh, I, we have incredible students in the project and I can't, again, thank everybody enough. Um, again, James, Corey, uh, Claire, Irene, you did an incredible job. Kudos to the four of you for your work on this. And thank you everyone for, for um, listening in. Linda, thank you so much. Corey, James, Irene, Claire, we really appreciated your work. This was the perfect follow-up to our keynote last night where Peggy Shepard reminded us that um, do no harm does not mean do nothing. And there are many efforts. And in fact, people with lived experience should be leading the way um, and they always have been. And I think that your work here has uh, demonstrated the, the need for more research, more awareness and increased exposure of the efforts of so many community members organizing locally um, in the absence of state and federal policy that is supportive of those efforts. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to come back at one o'clock. Our next panel, Under the Roof Conversations with Community, will feature Brianna Sturkey, paralegal at New York Civil Liberties Union and Barnard Class of 2020 alum in conversation with local community members uh, from Community Board uh, 9, as well as uh, community organizations working in Upper Manhattan, Harlem, and Morningside Heights. We really look forward to that panel and we're going to pause until then and we'll see you at one o'clock. Thank you again so much. Really appreciate it.